Being on TV is his comfort place, and that is largely because of his time on The Apprentice. If not for that show, which created the fictional TV version of Trump that audiences saw, he may never have wound up in the White House in the first place. Speaking to producers on the show, the New York Times pointed out last month how Apprentice producers had to cover for Trump, who at times had no idea what was going on on the show, especially when it came to firing someone. The Times writes, quote, for those moments when Mr. Trump's choice threatened to reflect badly on him and the show, Mark Burnett's producers waved their magic wands in the editing bay. Our job then was to reverse engineer the show and to make him not look like a complete moron, Mr. Braun said. They would go back through the tape from the week and selectively choose snippets to make the person who he fired look not as good. Joining me now is John D. Miller, former chief marketer for our sister network, NBC. This week, he wrote in U.S. News & World Report about his regret leading the team that marketed The Apprentice. Also joining me is Tim O'Brien, senior executive editor of Bloomberg Opinion and an MSNBC political analyst and pal of the show. Thank you both for being here. It's great to meet you, Mr. Miller. I want to read you to yourself. I'm going to read you to you. You wrote this. You wrote... We created a monster. Trump was a TV fantasy invented for The Apprentice. At NBC, we promoted the show relentlessly. Thousands of 30-second promo spots that spread the fantasy of Trump's supposed business acumen were beamed over the airwaves to nearly every household in the country. The image of Trump that we promoted was highly exaggerated. In fact, Trump declared business bankruptcy four times before the show went into production and at least twice more during the, his 14 seasons hosting. The imposing boardroom where he famously fired contestants was a set because the real boardroom was too old and shabby for TV. I also learned from working with him that he has questionable judgment. At the wrap party for The Apprentice season three, he pitched an idea for the upcoming season. This is wild. He told me we should make a team of black players compete against white players. My first thought was WTF. Yes. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the way that, the, the, that Trump was in reality versus the Trump that people saw on the show. Well, uh, what you see right now is sort of what he was in reality. Um, he was, to a large degree, um, someone who was an entertainer. He really was not a good businessman. Our job, is, from a marketing perspective, for the conceit of the show, was to make it seem like he was a legitimate businessman, competent, good judgment, compassion when needed. Mm -hmm. None of those things were actually apparent, uh, but that's what we had to do to make the show work. And so we created that narrative, made it seem like it was money, like he was living in royalty, yeah. with the, the, the cars and the limousines and the helicopter all labeled Trump in golden, um, gilded, like the gilded New York age, and then had to position him as a great uh, potential CEO. Yeah. And I say potential because he never really was a That's CEO. Right. There was a lot of little businesses that he had. Yeah. But they, to make the show work, we had to make it seem like that. And unfortunately, that, because we just pummeled American with those messages, yeah. that remains there right now. And to many people, even though there is significant things that you can see right, right now that is that where that's not true, many people think it is. And, and right now with the uh, economy being one of those things that people are looking at, we made him think, seem to be a very smart businessman. Yeah. And quite honestly, that is not true because he wouldn't, wouldn't have four bankruptcies and then ultimately six during the time of an apprentice if he was that good. Right. And I mean, look, Mark Cuban is, is, on, is on a TV show, but that's because he's judging other businesses and he's a very successful yes. businessman and really genuinely rich. But Tim, we've talked about this a lot. Donald Trump was not as rich as he said he was. Right. He's definitely not that successful. His company was just a little series of LLCs. He doesn't even own most of the buildings with the word Trump on them. Talk about the real Donald Trump and what do you think was the damage done by people really genuinely believing that Trump really was successful. Well, I mean, I think The Apprentice was his ticket to the White House. Absolutely. But prior to The Apprentice, he was this punchline of jokes about the excesses of the 1980s. He was out in the tundra. No one did big deals with him. He was an afterthought on comedy shows. He was this sort of subject of ridicule, and New Yorkers knew him as like, one of the sort of dirigibles you float above the city as a feature of New York life, but he wasn't a major real estate developer. The real estate community shunned him. 
and he had this very fortunate intersection with Mark Burnett. Mm -hmm. And Mark Burnett, who was an immigrant, was selling blue jeans in California and read Art of the Deal. And it was like his Bible to the American dream. And he always thought, he told me this, that, that he would one day do a show that embodied the spirit of the Art of the Deal. But remember, the Art of the Deal itself is a book. It's a nonfiction yeah. work of fiction. That Chong didn't even write. He didn't even write it. And the whole thing is full of errors and mythologizing and presenting him as a great deal maker when he wasn't a great deal maker. He routinely got taken to the cleaners by other deal makers. He overpaid. He went into debt. Yeah. He went into bankruptcy. And then The Apprentice rolls around via Mark Burnett. And he gets recreated as this entrepreneurial guru to the masses, when in fact he was a serial bankruptcy artist. Uh, as you know, as John noted, his real office in Trump Tower was like this relic of the 1980s, shag carpeting, you know, crummy furniture. I heard the exact same thing when I wrote my book, Man Who Sold America. I interviewed somebody who was a contestant on one of the seasons of The Apprentice who said, it was kind of shocking to see how shabby the, the boardroom was in the real Trump Tower. And, and he still wears the same suits and ties and shirts that he wore in that. <laughs> They're down to his knees yeah. like he's a, you know, a, a church deacon from the 1980s. Yeah, like baked in amber yeah. of that era. And I think that, that the, the, the myth of him being a, an unusually gifted businessman is what sold him to voters. Yeah in 2016. Yeah, and they still do, you still hear people say, well, I'm gonna vote for him because he's a businessman or stands the economy. Let's play a clip from The Apprentice. This is one of the sort of moments when he sort of showed who he really is, uh, the vile person that he is. Here it is. I, at this point, am the team chooser, not the team leader. Yeah, but you dropped to your knees. Yes. You begged to do this, and I said, I'm looking around the room, and we had even Latoya who said, we saw him, he thought, maybe Brady was right. a pretty picture, you dropped the John and Dennis. I mean, that's, that's, that, that was a, a glimpse at of, yeah, of a real Yeah, that, that got into the Celebrity Apprentice at that point, um, <laughs> where it sort of got into the later seasons, but he didn't do quite that much to people that he didn't know. Sometimes the celebrities, he could do that a little harder. But um, going back to the casting, the, the, the reason that Donald Trump got cast, because almost no other CEO would do it. They did have right. a lot of doing some with other CEOs. Sure. Because um, they didn't have the time, because they had real jobs and money. Right. And, the, the, and he, dignity. Yeah, he had, well, he and had, he needed the money, right? He, 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 at that point, because he was bankrupt, yes, and he made most of his money off the integrations of the shows and um, the black versus white thing, when he told me about that, I had to, I basically had to think about how do I do it, because you don't, you don't want to make him mad, but the right. same token, I had to say, what are you, crazy? Yeah. So the, what I did was, I said, you know, I can see why you think that would be a noisy idea, because everybody would be talking about it, you know, right. headlines everywhere. Was but, the idea that he thought it would prove some sort of racial superiority of white people? That probably was, right. and then, then I, I said, you're going to lose money because you make most of your money off the integrations, and there's not going to be a company that's going to want to touch that. And what would he have done if the black team had won? He probably would have had a complete meltdown. Uh, you know, the other piece about it is that he's also... He benefits from a, a level of sycophancy that I think most people can't imagine ever having to do with their real life. This is Stephen Miller, the architect of his child separation policy, commenting on his performance at the Al Smith dinner. That was the single best comedy performance of any president or candidate for president in history. But what made his comedy set even more extraordinary was the jokes were politically devastating for Kamala. He absolutely crushed the Democrats tonight. He, he did the same thing about the Bloomberg interview, the disastrous Bloomberg interview, in which he couldn't even explain tariffs. And he said it was the greatest live interview any political leader or politician has done on the economy in our lifetimes. Period. I mean, it, he has people doing that for him well, all the time. Because to leader. survive in his orbit, you have to, do you have to kiss the ring. Yeah. And and he tends to attract C minus people. He's yeah, he, that guy definitely is that. Yeah, and I think you know, in both his business life and political life, he has never had first rate people who are much sought after talents. What he has are people who either think they can take advantage of him, they usually are proven wrong, uh, or they're people who are just sub-level and they think that they can get into the spotlight and ride his coattails, yeah. and they know that to stay there, they've got to kiss the ring. He, he, he is the single most easy person to manipulate that I've ever worked with. Wow. Um, and quite honestly, the, the easiest thing, he has an unfillable hole for compliments. People that would make anybody blush and say, oh, no, no, too much, that never happens to him. So you can do it in grand uh, doses, and when you do that, 
he is your genius. Yeah. And he called me many times a genius. I, I'm a good marketer, I don't know if I'm a genius, yeah. but then if you see, disagree with him, you're an idiot. Yeah, I don't think I'm an idiot either, yeah. maybe not somewhere in between, yeah. but quite honestly, it was black or white with him. Yeah, and he does it now where he, you know, to try to explain, he tries to say, well, no one wants to work with Kamala Harris, and no one wants to work with him, but most of the people who worked with him don't want anything to do with his new campaign. But he says, oh, well, they were terrible people, I fired them because they were awful, right? Like, he can never... But, but the fact that she's just, attracted to her campaign some of the best political well, offerings Cheney, in, the, in, the, in, in the country <laughs> and Republicans. So Absolutely. That math doesn't did, work. Did it surprise you when the, the, the gimmick that made him famous made him president? <laughs> That he became president. Yes, well, it became, it was less surprising than disturbing yeah. because I knew I was complicit in it. Yeah. And that's, that was um, difficult to do. And the reason that I'm coming forward now, first off, as an executive for a long time, I really couldn't speak up at that point. I retired a couple of years ago. And I said, well, a few, few weeks ago, I said, well, what can I do? And I said, I have to tell this story because I hope it's not too late, but <laughs> I helped pull the wool over America's eyes towards a guy that should not be president, should never be president, and should be fired yeah. from the from the whole thing. You know who says the same thing? Tony Schwartz, the guy who really wrote Art of the and Tony has a lot of guilt. About and he, he, he said exactly the same thing, sitting exactly where you're sitting on this set. Uh, John D. Miller, thank you so much, and I appreciate you coming forward, truly. Tim O'Brien, my friend, thank you. We Thanks appreciate good. you always. And up next, the crucial state of Michigan, with both Trump